I'm Bill Madro, a part of the EPC committee for SOA. Good to see everybody in the afternoon. Hope we had, everybody had a nice lunch. Um, I'm excited today to host this session and introduce our speakers. Uh, the It's Flickr and Football, Creating Approachable Archives for Alumni. And I want to welcome our colleagues from the University of Nebraska Omaha. So we're really excited to have people outside of Ohio attend and present. So uh, Wendy Guerrera is the Digital in Initiatives Archivist at the University of Nebraska at Omaha Libraries, Archives, and Special Collections. In her role, she is responsible for the access to and preservation of digitized analog and born digital collections. She holds an MLS from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and is active in leadership positions within the Society of American Archivists Electronic Records section in the Digital Library Federation's Digital Accessibility Working Group, Policies and Workflows subgroup. Wendy's scholarship activity focuses on equitable internships, community partnerships, disability within the library and archive sphere, and the accessible digital collections. <clears throat> Amy Schindler is the director of the archives and special collections at the University of Nebraska at Omaha Libraries. In addition to administrative duties, Amy is responsible for donor engagement, development, and external outreach. She holds an MLS and an MA in history from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. She is currently serves on the E2 Exhibits and Events Committee for the Society of American Archivists, Reference Access and Outreach section, as well as local professional groups. Uh, I encourage you to put your, uh, we'll answer questions after the session, but please uh, I'll remind you to put your questions into the chat. And now I turn it over to our presenters. Give it a second there. I hope everyone can see that. We're good. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for that introduction, Bill. Um, I'm Wendy Guerra, and with me today is Amy Schindler. We'd like to thank everyone for joining us over Zoom and the Society of Ohio Archivists for hosting us. Uh, today, Amy and I are going to be sharing our experiences with the University of Nebraska at Omaha's Football Digitization and Access Project. This afternoon, I'll start things off by giving you an overview of our digital collections um, at UNO, and Amy will share the backstory of the football project. I'm then going to touch on our process for digitizing the collections and providing access via our former content management system, Island Dora. Having that background will hopefully provide a clear picture for what led me to trial and implement Flickr to provide access to the football photos. Amy will share ways that she promoted the content and connected with alumni supporting their engagement with the material. We'll then wrap up with an overview of where we stand with Flickr now, um, some notes on accessibility, and the several things we're still trying to figure out despite our overall satisfaction with Flickr. So just to jump right in, I apologize if that looks blurry on your end. It looked clear for me, so I hope you get the picture. Um, at UNO, we have roughly 60 terabytes of digital content and most of that is in our backlog. Um, only about two terabytes of that is accessible via our various online platforms. Um, on screen here, you can see a variety of those platforms. We recently completed the first phase of a migration from our Lyris' hosted instance of Island Door 7 to JSTOR. Um, we provide access to university archives, manuscript collections, and some community collections there as well. We also actively use the Internet Archive for books and published materials along with our yearbooks and are in the process right now of ingesting our student newspaper. Historically, we've used Omeka for exhibits and collections, but have yet, um, well, we're sort of moving away from using um, Omeka for collections items and we're aiming more for like an exhibit focus there. And lastly, we also have materials in our institutional repository, Digital Commons, as well as YouTube, Yuja and SoundCloud. Um, and we use all of those platforms along with Archive Space and Alma Primo for description. So why all of those platforms, you might wonder. Um, and primarily, the reason is cost and what's available to us on campus. Uh, we use the tools that we have available to make the greatest amount of our collections available to folks. Um, it would be great to have a custom built database and system to house and provide access to our content um, all in one place. That would be amazing. Uh, but that dream would come with a hefty price tag, so I work with what I have, what's possible. Um, 
So with all of those options, you might wonder if I really needed to explore another platform. And the answer is yes. Yes, I did. Uh, for reasons that I'll get into a little bit. Um, but for now, I will just say that for nearly the past year, we've been steadily increasing access to thousands of minimally described football photos from our UNO photograph collection via a Flickr Pro account. Um, in total, there are roughly 78,000 digitized photos, a result of a specific project where digitized everything was the goal. Um, how did we get there? You might wonder, why would we do that? And uh, for that information, I'm gonna hand it off to Amy. Thank you. Um, yeah, so let me just give you a little backstory about football at UNO and the first football items from archives that were digitized first. Um, so the University of Omaha, as our employer was then known, fielded its first football team in 1911, just a couple of years after the university was established. And then the University of Nebraska at Omaha discontinued the football and wrestling programs in spring 2011. Um, I won't get into the details today. That's a decision that was tied to the university's move from NCAA Division II to Division I, budgets and boosters, kind of the usual suspects. Um, the end of the football program was a big surprise, to put it mildly, and it was an absolute fumble by the administration, um, if you will. Not surprisingly, many alumni had nothing good to say about athletics or UNO at the time and for many years after, um, and that included the leaders and staff, and those alumni chose to cut ties. The library, though, specifically archives and special collections, continued engaging with these now very emotional alumni whenever possible. As you would expect, the then university archivist highlighted the university archives' continuing role to preserve and share football's history. He made it clear that archives and football are separate from those decisions made by university leaders. The football team may be gone, but the history of UNO and OU football would always be part of the history of the university and in the archives. Next slide, please. So the first university sponsored event for these alienated football alumni was an April 2014 reunion for the undefeated 1954 team that beat Eastern Kentucky University on New Year's Day 1955 to win the Tangerine Bowl in a score of seven to six. <laughs> the Dean of the Library at the time in 2019 or 2014, um, he left a lot to be desired, um, but even he saw the potential benefit to the library of building bridges to this large group of alumni that had been alienated from their previous university home and athletics. Um, it also helped that at the time, the father of the library's business manager himself had been a player on that Tangerine Bowl team. And so the business manager supported and was available to work on planning and executing the event. Uh, the Tangerine Bowl uh, reunion event brought together over 20 of the remaining players, their families, the original radio announcer, children of the coaches, um, a couple cheerleaders, and at least one member of the marching band. The highlight of the event was that this was the first time the film of the Tangerine Bowl game was synced with the audio, radio, the radios, uh, the audio from the radio play-by-play -play, um, of the game. So the archives had had the film for many years, but no sound. And the year prior, the audio had been donated to the library, and so the university archivist had both digitized and then synced them. So folks were excited to watch and listen um, to the game, and they remained glued to their seats for the whole thing. In advance of the Tangerine Bowl reunion, the library digitized the Tangerine Bowl photos and the game program, and they uploaded those items to Content DM, the platform the library was using at the time. Um, but that was a platform the archives had no access to, really no say in. And this is for weird staffing and workplace personality reasons that completely predate Wendy and mostly predate my time at UNO. Um, however, though, this was the first digitization of UNO football material. Um, and it was pretty exciting. The response of the alumni and other folks to what was mostly photos po posted online was appreciative, um, but they weren't super interested. Their focus was really on that game film and audio, um, which were also posted online. Um, we passed out DVD copies of the game film um, at the event and mailed out lots for weeks afterwards, as well as sharing the links to the photos that were online. Um, after this event, we were in sort of a stewardship mode of the digital collections and those alumni. Um, I also want to briefly mention the Marlon Briscoe online exhibit. In 2015-2016, um, we in the archives learned that UNO alum Marlon Briscoe, who was the first black starting quarterback in modern professional football, would be honored on campus with a statue, and then later inducted in the College Football Hall of Fame. At that time, our archives colleague, Angela Krager, um, created an online exhibit about his ONE, uh, UNO years in our Omeka.net instance. And this was based on an in-person display they'd previously curated. 
Um, and we received immediate positive feedback on those exhibits, especially the online one from Development Officer in Athletics and Mr. Briscoe. Um, a lot of the time weren't super interested, but later they became much more appreciative of it. And it's become a regular part of our social media posts. Um, you know, to football alumni specifically, but on our general library social media as well. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, getting to the game plan. So in 2019, archives in the library, we hosted a second reception for football alumni. And this one um, coincided with another Tangerine Bowl anniversary year, but our intentions had shifted. We intentionally changed the event to be a general football, alum football alumni reunion event. We still honored the Tangerine Bowl players and several describing alumni joined us. But by 2019, we had a new library dean, we had a new wonderful development officer assigned to the library. So that was an important change for us. Um, we had also hired our first digital initiatives archivist. We'd never had one before, um, but they had left. We were in the process of hiring our second one, Wendy. Um, so unlike the first event in 2014, in 2019, we held the reception and displays intentionally in and around the archives. And we featured many of the football photos, the memorabilia, yearbooks, game programs, and then the videos we had in the collection. And you can see some of those display cases and pop-up displays in the photos on the slide there. The intention for the, event, for the event was to introduce the archives to more football alumni, both physically and as a concept. So to start building our football mailing list of friends who would then hopefully support football and its preservation and access in the archives. Um, and that was a success for us. Um, we had um, almost 100 RSVPs. And then after the event, we ended up with um, an up-to-date and accurate mailing list, always helpful, um, of over 100 alumni who had either RSVP'd or attended that event. Um, we had promises from folks to donate memorabilia, game films, and more. I'd had some conversations with people about, you know, our plans, things we'd like to do, digitization um, and preservation. And so we had the potential for future donations. And I had a couple of strong leads coming out of that event. Um, our, auda our audacious goal at the time was to raise enough money to fund the digitization of football materials by students. Um, all of it. Our short-term goal, though, was $5,000, just $5,000, so we could hire a student and pay them a minimum wage, and then they could begin scanning some of the football material. And at the time, we didn't know exactly how many football images we had, because the collection was only partially processed. But we knew there were tens of thousands of photos, slides, negatives, some panoramic photos from the 19 teams, and then some digital images, of course, just some. <laughs> <laughs> um, we came out of the November 2019 event with a few more donations of material, those names of prospects, and then of uh, allies. The leads had led into allies. So we were ready to do our first crowdfunding campaign. But then, of course, 2020 happened. So instead of a spring 2020 campaign, um, online giving campaign, it became a November <laughs> and really winter um, into February 2020, 2021 online giving campaign. Um, the archives became the first campus office to do a solo crowdfunding campaign with our university foundation's new online giving platform. So they were actually willing to pay attention to us and work with us, which wasn't always the case. Um, minus all of the credit card and other fees, though, we raised just over $5,000, which met our goal. And that included two matching gifts, um, a significant one from an alum and a smaller one from our library dean. We knew we would need to raise additional dollars, obviously, to meet our audacious goal. And we expected to do another campaign in two years or so. Um, in the immediate term though, we were able to match those uh, donated dollars with an internal grant. We're fortunate one of Chris Library's three endowments is the Eugene S. and Sunny M. Thomas Endowed Fund for Innovation. Um, and that was basically established by library donors uh, to match dollars secured by library employees for any sort of innovative project we want to propose. At the time, there were enough funds, and so we basically matched those dollars in April 2021. And I will pass it back to Wendy. So the stage is set for uh, the spring of 2021. I realize now I should have used something like the field is like set up. I apologize. I didn't get the football pun in there. Um, but you have a bit of context now for why digitizing and providing access to, you know, football material has been a major step towards connecting with alumni while simultaneously funding projects that increase access in archives and special collections. Um, I'm going to touch a bit on the nitty gritty of digitization next before talking about access and what led me to consider Flickr. The whole football project consists of several on-process collections. 
uh, including the football media guides and program series of the UNL Athletics Collection, the football series of the UNL Photograph Collection that I previously mentioned, and then um, about four small individual uh, manuscript um, collections as well. I say on process to indicate that while these materials have now been organized prior to digitization, they've not yet been described in archive space finding aids. A little bit, like they're mentioned in there, but they're not fully built out. Um, so I hired a student employee in June of 2021, and they immediately began organizing the football series of the photograph collection. In about three months, they had um, arranged and described and digitized about 4 Hollinger boxes of photographs and negatives before leaving the project. Um, I thought that they would be with us longer than three months. That was not intentional. Um, if you maybe employ students, you may understand that it's been kind of a rocky road since 2020 for hiring and retention. Um, so in the same time frame, we had a goal of getting that first batch of photos online um, into our, at the time, relatively new Lyricist hosted instance of Island Door 7. We'd only had that platform for about a year um, prior to the annual fall football alumni gathering. Um, and thankfully, I was able to get the first 838 images from the 1910s to 1960s into Island Dora. These photos were a mixture of compound objects, so the fronts and the backs of the photos were scanned, and then just large TIFF images. All of these photos were individually described, um, as that earliest content in the photo collection was really well identified with writing on the backs of those photos. Uh, a selection of those photos can be seen on the slide here. Um, it's screenshots of how those photos displayed in Island Dora. I knew that once we got into the 1970s, we'd have a challenge as the quantity of images really began to take off at that point, and much of the content has minimal description, sometimes indicating what game it was from um, or practice, um, maybe a specific photo shoot for a given year, but most of it, some of it, uh, it doesn't have that. Um, large batches of photos have the same description, like hundreds of photos with description that's a bit more granular than folder level title. Fortunately, I was able to keep the project moving forward despite the change in staff. Uh, that fall, I hired a new student in October who quickly began digitizing all the slides. He picked right up where the former student had left off with only a couple months of downtime. And I'll note here that parameters for digitization um, were established in hopes that this could be a one and done approach. Digitize it one time and hopefully not have to touch it again. Or, you know, sort of, that's like always, you know, a goal. Um, one of the library staff members is shown here on the slide um, digitizing a photo on our Epson flatbed scanner. It's nothing really fancy, it's pretty standard stuff. Um, so we're scanning the photos around 600 PPI. Uh, and the negatives between 1,000 and 4,000 PPI, depending on the size of the content. Uh, this information is worth noting because of how much storage we were using with the size of those preservation and production masters. Um, that amount of storage uh, we used, it grew very quickly, very, very quickly um, with all those uncompressed TIFFs. But I was committed to having those. <laughs> I didn't want JPEGs at the moment. Um, so while my student employee was digitizing, I began talks with lyricists about how we might provide access to large quantities of photos that all had similar or identical description. Um, it was important that users would be able to easily access the content and browse as they desired. The current content models in Islandora 7 do not support such use as the large image, uh, basic image and compound object content models are all intended for item level description um, for items viewed one at a time. You can't click from one photo just to the next. You have to go back uh, to a higher level. So Lyris' support and I began exploring the possibility about uh, building out a gallery option, something about a custom built display. But progress on that effort paused when we hit our max for available space in Island Dora in December of 21. I had already requested uh, earlier that year and we had purchased um, additional space, but I hit that 1.5 terabyte max um, with only a fraction of the football material online. So this was a little bit of a puzzle and it was further complicated um, just timing. Um, I had some upcoming leave planned and of course like the new year. So it became a waiting game of budgets um, with that new fiscal year on the horizon. 
So I was out on leave for several months and my student employee continued working. He finished digitizing the football series of the photograph collection during that time. Um, and then also began pulling thousands of born digital images from DVDs. He also scanned all the football media guides um, and the programs. We didn't upload any new content to Island Dora for a while until I was able to reformat and shift some collections. Um, and that means that I removed some things that were in Island Dora and I reformatted some of those large TIFF images to basic images into JPEGs for online viewing, um, allowing us to provide access to those media guides and programs. And screenshots of those materials are what's on screen right now. Um, these resources were specifically really helpful and continue to be for photo identification and research that's often requested of our assistant archivist. So they needed to be prioritized for online access. I had to make space for them in Islandora. Um, unfortunately, I was still at a total loss of what to do with the remainder um, of the photograph collection. Um, you know, just under 78,000 images from 1970 to 2010, just staring me in the face with no easy solution. And my discussion with Lyrisys about that custom option completely stopped uh, once we learned that they would cease hosting Islandora 7 in April of 2024. So we decided not to explore purchasing additional space and just plan for a future change. Um, I started considering other options while also trying to make our current platform work. Um, we did have another two years with them and I felt like it was my best option. Um, additionally, the, you know, the crowdfunding push, the support, all the momentum, it was happening right in that moment. It was really driving the prioritization of this work. So I really felt the need to figure out a way to provide access. I felt like I had this list of requirements that I was continuously rolling around in my brain um, that you know seem reasonable when I say them. I, I needed to provide access to thousands of images with um, sets of hundreds that all had the same description. I needed our audience to be able to browse and click through photos as they relived their UNO glory days. I needed the interface to be usable. Seems reasonable. I wanted it to be approachable by our target audience, but that sheer quantity of material paired with the limited and repetitive description required me to consider ways that I could provide access through Islandora, but not be confined by it. So enter my inquiry to the library's network services manager and that resulted in her proposing using simple light box um, to create galleries for photo viewing online. We played around with some display options and I experimented with how we'd provide access uh, through Islandora. And after running through a couple different versions with my coworkers, um, I tested an approach where we used just a single image basic image content model with a single thumbnail in Islandora to link out to a full light box gallery of images that all had the same description. Um, you know, funny, I tested this process on my dad um, to see how our intended audience age group might react. And it was mostly sort of a success with the help of my mom, thanks parents. Um, and this approach had the necessary benefit of taking up minimal space in Islandora since access was facilitated by the CMS, but none of those images were actually in the database. Okay, so you might be thinking, maybe this is gonna work, what happened? Well, um, you also might wanna see a screenshot of what it looked like, but I've deleted it. <laughs> uh, since we've recently migrated from Islandora to JSTOR, so you'll just have to imagine um, this gallery style with slightly confusing text that linked out to a carousel of images that users could download. Uh, if it sounds confusing, you aren't wrong. It rather confused our users too, and they didn't really end up using it. Um, I'll get into that a bit later though. Uh, Simple Lightbox was a stopgap solution that turned out to be rather short term. It demonstrated to me that I really needed a better interface than what my current setup could provide if I wanted to engage with our demographic and it had to work with our existing level of minimal description um, as I just don't have capacity for item level description at this scale. So while well, Islandora was sort of, but not really, meeting our needs under our existing contract, my student employee just kept working away. He just kept going. Um, he organized and digitized the four small manuscript collections related to the university records, and our collections just kept growing. Um, so through some more shuffling and reformatting in Islandora, I was able to add those additional four manuscript collections to the platform. But I was sort of ignoring the UNO photograph collection problem or um, to phrase that differently, I was focusing on other things in the fall of 2022 
Um, I was investigating other platforms, um, hoping that it might solve my existing photo problem, since a migration had to happen anyways. Um, and by January of last year, I'd explored a few platforms to replace Islandora 7, including Preservica, Alma Digital, Omeka, and Photo Shelter. Those were just a few. If you're interested, I explored a lot more. Feel free to contact me. <laughs> I'm sharing all this because I think it's important to explain that I was actively considering testing and evaluating platforms before it occurred to me that Flickr, this blast from the past, might be our best option to explore. So I did. I brought up the idea of Flickr to Amy um, and was surprised to learn that the library already had an account from years before. I shouldn't have been surprised. I realize now that lots of institutions used to use Flickr a lot more heavily than they do now. Um, but our account had been implemented and used prior to the 2018 decision to limit free users to that 1,000 photo maximum. So it's pretty uh, amazing that when we stopped paying for that pro account in 2017, those thousands of photos have never disappeared. They're still there. Um, I'm hoping that this is a good omen for the future longevity of the platform and its storage servers. Um, but after poking around the library's original account for a little bit, I decided to create a free trial version, specifically for archives and special collections. I really felt it was appropriate that that content be separated from all of that existing material. So I tested the use of albums to describe a set of described photos. For our analog photos and slides, we might have 400 per folder or slide box. You know, earlier in this presentation, I said 800, and that could be true. It's a huge range. Um, but maybe a set of 73 of those have a description of football practice circa 1977. And maybe another set of 18 says football media day, 1983. So this isn't item level description, and it's a bit more than folder level description. And it works in Flickr. Um, I learned that I could ingest batches of photos with the same metadata applied <clears throat> to each description field while retaining a unique title um, that was actually the file name um, automatically populated. So this worked perfectly because if someone asks me where a photo is by its unique file name, I can find it for them. Um, I could provide the high res version for them if that's what they're requesting. And that's a little bit ahead of myself here, but the point that I'm trying to make is that I was quickly able to determine that Flickr could be a great tool for us to provide online access um, to our thousands of photos. The relatively simple public interface um, appeared to offer what I needed most for our users, the ability to browse and flick through images without any complications. The ease in which links to albums could be shared was a major bonus. And to top off my excitement, the price for unlimited storage just cannot be beat. Um, at the time that we started, it was $133 for two years in comparison to the triple digit cost that I was looking at uh, for other platforms on an annual basis. Um, so I made this proposal to Amy that we use the free edition of Flickr until we reach that 1000 max and then upgrade. She agreed and about one month into the project, we upgraded to the pro account. Um, so shown on screen here, you can see on the left there is the football collection within Flickr. And then on, it contains all those albums that are in that collection. And then um, on the right, you can see a little bit more detail about what those albums might be. You might be able to see that the albums contain a wide range of photos in terms of quantity. Um, just in this small selection, the albums range from seven photos in one to 265 in another. Now, some of you might be wondering why I didn't opt to use Flickr Commons, which was intentionally created for library and archive historical photo collections back in 2008. And it is still thriving, um, although not under their original owners. And well, we're using the pro version of Flickr so that we can retain the copyright to our photos. Um, additionally, these football materials were scanned as part of a large scale effort. There are materials in there that we don't own copyright to, but it was determined that the risk was low. So we moved forward with it. Um, all of our photos have the Creative Commons attribution of non-commercial, meaning that folks are free to share, um, adapt, but give appropriate credit, et cetera. Um, we wouldn't have had that option in the Flickr Commons where things need to be tagged as no known copyright. So shown here on screen in a bit more detail um, is one selected album and then a single photo within that album. And I apologize if that didn't come through clearly with that metadata information. It was
was a little bit strange. No matter how much I tried to zoom in, the picture just got bigger and the metadata kind of stayed the same or even got smaller. So this work was done by a library staff member from outside the Archives and Special Collections Department, whose supervisor had been supportive of their contributions to the project. Um, we've been really fortunate that this staff member has um, aimed to complete about five hours a week on this project for the past 11 months. To create this content uh, shown on screen, they take the description from a spreadsheet um, created by former student employees, which isn't always correct, and apply any edits needed the best that they can. And then they upload batches of photos that all have the same description as albums. As I indicated previously, albums can have two to hundreds of photos, and each photo in the album has the same descriptive metadata applied, similar to the concept of folder level metadata, but a bit more granular. That description is pretty simple. Um, it just contains the title of the set, the date and human readable format, if we have it available, a subseries of football, series of athletics, followed by the collection title, the collecting area, and our repository name. It's similar to a citation. And this uh, publicly displayed metadata matches the collection level metadata embedded within each photo. The goal being that we can always track down where this photo came from if it's brought to us by a researcher asking, hey, can I get a copy of this? Which, that, that happens. So each photo is also tagged with the collection ID and the rights information is recorded. Lastly, um, after uploading, these photos are edited to reflect the date taken um, information to as close as what we know, in addition to retaining that date uploaded info. So this means that users can view our photos along a timeline and select whatever year they're most interested in for viewing. And this is really, really useful if they're only interested in photos from maybe when they were at UNO or a family member. Um, so after we had these first few albums created, we had tested the delivery to the alumni Facebook group and had a good response. Um, Amy's gonna share a bit about that. Okay, there we go. Yeah, I know it's 2024. I should learn to unmute. So, um, but before the 2019 uh, Grid Gridiron Memories reception, I created a LibGuide page, um, a page within an existing LibGuide um, that would be home to all of the links. And that was rather than directing alumni to, you know, the various finding aids we had. Oh, you're interested in videos? Go to this finding aid. Oh, you want to see media guides? Go to this finding aid. And then the online platforms we were using. So this included links to our previously digitized football videos that at the time um, were on our, our university's video platform host. Um, those game photos from the Tangerine Bowl we digitized. The Marlon Briscoe online exhibit, which was over on Omeka.net. The yearbooks, which are over on the Internet Archive. Um, and then it also just listed the archival material that was not yet digitized trying to make the case to folks of like, here's all the things that could be yours online someday. Um, we started sharing the QR code uh, to that lib guide on a postcard at the 2019 reception. And then we handed out to alumni um, at various other events and other opportunities. Somebody stopped in the archives and talked about how they played football or their father played football. You need this postcard. Um, so we handed out lots of them. Um, we haven't bothered to reprint them though, because I feel like we sort of saturated our market with those. Um, and like, I literally just saw one in, uh, in a class of 1951 alumnus's apartment three weeks ago. So they're out there, people are holding onto them and they're using them. That's great. Um, so um, also at the 2019 reception, some of the alumni there told me that I just had to join their private UNO football Facebook group because that's where everyone was. Everyone is there, Amy. It felt very much like middle school, y'all. Um, but <laughs> he said, you know, I would find many interested folks there to promote the collections to. And then of course, I was thinking about potential future donations of more material for the archives and then prospects for helping to fundraise for this. So I did eventually join the Facebook group. Um, I lurked for a while, um, so I didn't really post much. Um, you know, and I learned to remind myself, hey, Amy, you don't have to read every comment on every post. Um, but, uh, you know, once uh, content started to get into Islandora, um, I started sharing, you know, links to the media guides and the game programs as they were being uploaded. You know, I'm always telling alumni, more are coming um, and got good feedback, you know, got a few likes on posts, um, a couple comments. Great. Um, pretty long-winded, y'all. I'm gonna I admit that to you. My posts are pretty long-winded here early on. Um, these posts, though, um, they were irregular. 
I didn't have a schedule. Um, you know, I did not mention in every single post that the digitization was made possible with the donations of alumni just like them. Um, but I definitely mentioned that some of the time and that there were, you know, students and, and other employees that Amy Schindler working on this back in the archives. Um, you know, I found pretty quickly, um, you know, they would like the posts, but they were really not interested in those um, photos that were first digitized of like early, the early history of football, basically the pre-1960s content. They were not interested for the most part. Um, but one of the things I picked up um, on while lurking and occasionally liking posts um, in the Facebook group was that um, one of the former coaches was very active, in, is still very active in the group. And when he posted, alumni tended to follow. You know, they'd, they'd like what he said, they'd comment, they'd interact with him. So one of the things I did in the post on the right here, um, when I was promoting the photos newly available via um, Islandora and Simple Lightbox, was I linked to the, you know, the whole Islandora set or the Islandora link. But then I found a photo of the coach and, you know, tagged him and like, hey, look at you, um, you know, hoping that and suspecting he would take a look and maybe some of his players would check it out as well. Um, then in 2021, 22, I would say I would have alumni messaging me, seeking photos of themselves. So their family members were asking for photos. You know, they wanted to do a Father's Day gift or a birthday gift. Um, and so it was really specific, like, no, no, I only want a photo of me from the 1993 game against Mankato State, not the 1994, 1992 game. It had to be 93. So um, I was able to hand those off to our colleague, Abby, our assistant archivist, who handles most of our remote researchers. And thank you to Abby um, <laughs> for working on that. And thank you to those alumni for adding to our reference transactions data um, for our annual report. Uh, so next slide. So in February, 2023, Wendy and I discussed when we should share the photos in this new Flickr trial with the Facebook, uh, the football group on Facebook. Um, you know, and as you can see by the, the post dated here, February 16th, 2023, we pretty quickly made that decision. All right, just go ahead and share it. Um, you know, and I told them this is a trial. We want you to look at it. Tell us what you think. Um, you know, this post received, um, I would say many more likes than I usually got to my other posts, um, which is great. <laughs> um, and, you know, and some comments there that were good. Um, and, you know, that was in comparison to when I was posting the Island Door link or the links or the LibGuide link. Um, and then we immediately noticed that folks were indeed clicking that face that that link in Facebook, going over to Flickr, looking at the sets um, and then paging through the sets. Um, what I discovered over time is they really only uh, most of them, I should say, most of the folks really only looked at the Flickr album I directly linked they were not going in the Flickr so much. And like, I'm gonna look at all the albums. They were looking at what it, what was posted this week. This week. So um, most of them are waiting for us to post something and that's okay, I guess. Um, we will typically see, you know, one to 200 views of an album after we posted it. And then even more views of individual photos. And those, that, those views are, you know, within a week or two, we see those numbers almost across the board. Um, and as you can see here in one of the comments on the right, um, some of the responses include identifying information for players, which was super exciting. Um, with some of my posts to the Facebook group, I would specifically ask them for help identifying like the year of a game. Like we know this is St. Cloud State. Anybody know what year it is? Um, or just, you know, general help narrowing down a date range. Like we think we know this is the 1970s, early 80s. What, what, how can you help us here? Um, most of the comments in Facebook are along the lines of, thank you, cool, or they make insider references to each other that really don't mean much to us who are not on the football team in 1984. And that's fine. They're having a good time. Um, one thing I especially appreciate in the comments is when alumni tag other folks, other alumni usually, um, and that's great to see them you know, sharing it that way. But because this is their private Facebook group, they can't directly share my posts outside of the group. And I have no idea how many of them are like resharing on their own Facebooks. Facebook, yeah, uh, Facebook. So I think we reached saturation, as I said before, with the football alumni, you know, between those who are in the Facebook group and then those who have um, come to the events on campus that we've been having, because um, they all seem to have that postcard and that QR code. Um, when I've mentioned the digital collections, you know, in 2019, it was a couple of people knew about it because they'd read, read to the end of the email invitation. Um, but we had um, 
uh, athletics hosted an event on campus in 2023, and we got a couple tables there to do a pop-up display, and we did that again earlier this year. And when I mentioned digital collections, you know, there was some awareness, but more this year it was like all the people were like, yes, Amy, we know. Thank you very much. You're that lady from the library. Okay. Um, so we've we've hit those people who are on campus. Um, also, after Flickr went live, I started posting the photo albums more frequently. Um, you know, I would usually every two weeks or so, but not always. Um, I I also at that point, um, uh, you can see there uh, my my Facebook. Uh, what do you call it? That my my icon there changed. I had been using my my real personal Facebook, and then because of the friend requests I was receiving and the research the reference questions I was receiving, um, I was just like, yep, nope, shut this down. So I created a professional Facebook, which is just where I, I use it for football and a couple other you know things. Um, and I just didn't want them posting on my on my personal Facebook. Um, I, I should also shout out, you know, we've we've also kind of got the alumni association's attention. Um, despite the, you know, the football team being canceled, going away, been a very touchy issue and um, for the university for you know over a decade. And so how it's brought up or mentioned in the alumni magazine even is is you know very very cautiously for most of the last, uh, what, 13 years. Uh, but the Illinois Association did give the Football Digital Collection a mention in an issue of the magazine last last fall, I think it was. Um, so we're pretty pleased with how that promotion of alumni is continuing and going. Um, and so I'm gonna punt it back to Wendy now. So where are we now? Well, um, we started tracking the project in November of 23. Um, this was about six months after we started ingesting into Flickr. Um, so our data is not really complete. And I can't tell you why I waited so long to start doing that. But I can tell you that it's very helpful to have this data. Um, you can see from the tracking, that's that screenshot of the Excel spreadsheet on the left, that in just over 40 hours of work spread out over the course of nearly a year, um, 7,321 photos have been added to Flickr. And this work isn't robotic. Uh, checking the accuracy of the descriptions supplied by former student employees requires looking over the images and often double checking the media guides for dates and game information. I can't really create a reliable formula for production knowing that information, but it looks like if we keep going at this same pace, it will take us about 10 years to complete the remaining 70,679 photos. And I'm undecided on whether we'll continue at this pace or even really in this manner. Um, but tracking this has allowed for some data to be created that can inform our work and express the time that it requires for a task that directly impacts our users. And the other image on the right here is a snip of our Flickr stats. Um, admittedly, I have yet to make full sense of them. Um, I'm not sure why they aren't more straightforward to me, um, but what I can clearly see is that our material is being viewed, um, and not just that first photo of the album, which typically gets the most clicks, um, or the image that Amy links to, I'm trying to think about how that works, like the linking on Facebook, um, but other images throughout the album are clicked through as well, and this is great. Um, what I take away from that is that folks are actually exploring the content in ways that they didn't in Islandora. And that's quite possibly because this method of interacting just wasn't possible. Um, I can see that our football photos have been viewed as a whole over 301,676 times as of Monday, um, with our most popular photos being viewed between four and 500 times. And that's pretty great uh, for us over the course of a year. Pretty happy with that. So despite this great traffic that we're seeing um, with our material in Flickr, there are a few things that we'd like to see improved um, or haven't yet figured out how to handle. Um, one thing we'd like to see improved is the accessibility of the platform. Um, I'll admit that this could be said about every out-of-the-box platform I have ever worked with or demoed, um, but we're talking about Flickr for now. So um, these are approachable archives. Um, they're not accessible in the sense that everyone has the equal ease in accessing them without barriers. We intentionally used the term approachable in our presentation title because while Flickr has increased access on a vast scale in an approachable way for our audience, it really isn't the most accessible. For instance, there's no way for alt text to be applied to the photos, even if I had capacity for item level description. 
Uh, the setup instead relies on the description field for those photos. And our approach of using album level metadata to describe those sets of photos isn't great for folks who may rely on that alt text. I realize this is a shortcoming and I don't currently know how to overcome it, so I'm just sharing it with you. In the course of my research on Flickr, I learned that they had updated the platform in 2016 for better keyboard navigation. Um, and I haven't seen anything like published recently indicating whether this is still difficult for folks to use or not. Um, and I did run a wave test, as you can see from the screenshot here. Um, and there were a number of errors returned. Um, I know, though, that this test is only one thing of many that could be used to evaluate the accessibility of a website. So not too much weight can be given here beyond noting that there are errors. Um, so lastly, I'll mention that I inquired with a colleague on the DLF Digital Accessibility Working Group about auditing Flickr for its usability. And this would mean evaluating it for how accessible it is for everyone to use. And they were a bit surprised and came back with a response of asking, are folks still using Flickr? Uh, which the answer is yes. Yes, they are. Uh, the Library of Congress, a pretty well-known institution, is still actively using Flickr Commons. They just uploaded new content last Friday. Uh, so this is a relevant platform. Um, accessibility should be considered. And I, I'm curious to explore um, where an accessibility audit could go with the DLF. So a few other things that we have yet to figure out include how to handle folks that want to comment on our photos in Flickr. We're currently um, having most of our content like pretty locked down, where only Flickr family and friends can comment. Um, so a person has to favorite an item, and then I'll add them as an OK contact, and then they can comment on it. And this isn't ideal, and there are obviously barriers to participation here. Um, we've only had one person do this, though, and their comment identifying the person in the photo is shown on the screenshot. Um, but truthfully, I don't have the capacity to monitor comments across thousands of images. And we're protecting against bots, spam, potentially negative posts about the former UNO athletic director who eliminated the football program, possibly words about the chancellor, etc. cetera. Um, it's a method that needs improvement. Um, a change we'd also like to make is incorporating a harmful material statement, like the one the library uses in the original Flickr account in the footer of every page. We haven't added such a statement to every image, and we need to do this for sports in particular, because the UNO had a Native American mascot until the early 1970s, so the imagery and text throughout the athletics content is racist. It's possible that I could make this change in the metadata, um, which I recently learned can be edited with simple HTML, to be way more helpful than what we're currently using. Um, and while not in the Flickr platform itself, uh, we still need to figure out how to track information provided via comments on Facebook posts. Amy's compiling screenshots of this data, but so far I've only incorporated the information um, on one instance where I took in an email, I commented in Flickr. It worked in a roundabout way, but it could be more standardized. The last thing I'm wondering about um, is uh, archive space. Are we gonna link to that? maybe in the future, um, but we know that our users aren't accessing this content via the finding aid. Um, um, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, and so um, as far as future funding, um, you know, our initial audacious goal idea was to fund student wages to digitize everything in the archives about football. And that was part of a long-term goal to establish an endowment for the student experience or even just athletics. And as far as department and library fundraising priorities, football has been moved to a lower priority in our campaign priorities for a whole bunch of reasons. I won't get into it. You can ask me about it later. Happy to talk about it. Um, but um, we're just looking at other things right now. We're still talking to donors um, and happy to talk to potential new donors, um, but we are exploring other options. Uh, okay, so related to funding, um, is Flickr long-term? Um, I'm not really sure. Um, I suppose it's probably as long term as any of the platforms I've used and migrated to and from um, over the last four years at UNO. Um, I'm pretty used to it at this point, but I think that Flickr has some staying power. The Flickr Foundation just joined the Digital Preservation Coalition this year and is hiring an archivist as well. So I think that this is an exciting platform to be a part of right now, even if it feels like a blast uh, from the early aughts. It is relevant. <laughs> Uh, to wrap up, um, Amy and I agree that Flickr isn't perfect, um, but the increase in traffic, engagement with alumni, continued support and appreciation for the work 
continues to surprise and delight us. Um, it's worth highlighting again just the significant difference in views in Islandora versus views and engagement in Flickr. Uh, Flickr has proven to be critical to um, this approachable use with our demographic. We have seen alumni resharing re screenshots of photos from Flickr um, back to the Facebook group rather than sharing a URL, and we wish that they weren't doing it that way, but they're engaging, and that's what counts. Um, and just like a bit of a story on that, Amy shared an album last Thursday, and despite um, we had, I had the wrong date information in there, um, folks engaged with it, and the album went from 11 views to 125 in just four days. And the comments, they provided the correct date information. So it's been wonderful um, for providing information, and it also gives us these lovely comments um, reminding us that the work we do is noticed and it's appreciated. Um, who else could give us this delightful array of emojis um, in response to providing online access? Nobody else. I, I don't know that we've ever received um, so much emoji love. I had so many emojis um, I didn't know existed, frankly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, for us, like tracking of those comments from the outreach post, it provides some additional identifying information to add. Um, it gives us some affirmations for the employees, and it leads to follow up with potential donors um, of items and funds for the archives. Yeah, and as I mentioned before, you know, I've consciously referenced Wendy and other members of the team in some of our posts, but I'm also just cautious about mentioning her too often for fear, for fear they'll reach out to her directly and be like, where's that 1985 game? Um, I, and I would share, you know, these thank yous and emojis with Wendy and team sometimes, and I haven't always been great about that. So now I'm I'm really committed to the screenshot sharing to get those affirmations for all of us for on those days we, we need those happy emojis. Yeah, That's I never great. thought I'd be here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I will just close by sharing that I have created one additional collection in Flickr aside from football. It's for the Metropolitan Community Church of Omaha, an LGBTQ affirming church that we're in the process of digitizing years worth of their photo albums for um, in preparation for their 50th anniversary this fall. Um, I'm, I'm really looking to see like how could we use this? They can use it as a slideshow, we could do it for crowdsourcing. Um, we have so many collections that could benefit from this type of access, and we suspect that our football alumni will not be the only ones who would benefit from this approachable sharing method. Um, we really look forward to exploring future opportunities with Flickr. I think we've got a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Wendy. A wonderful, wonderful presentation. So yeah, if you have questions, please drop them into the chat. Uh, we'll give people, there we go. Uh, okay. You see, uh, Benjamin wants to know, are you uploading to album, albums as images are digitized or do you wait until everything that, that will be in the album is ready before re loading them? <laughs> you can see that. Um, we have already digitized all the content. So I've got all the backlog of the thousands and thousands of images. Because we worked on that for quite a while before we started uploading anywhere. Yeah, and we're continuing to like, you know, I'll get donations of like, here's a dozen photos, you know, from an, an alum or a couple of photos from like an alum from 1951, a couple weeks ago. And so those haven't been digitized yet, but I'm kind of waiting. We've got 70,000, I mean, you know, thousands more to upload. Um, so I'm not rushing to like, oh, we need to digitize these 12 photos I picked up, you know, um, so that'll come later, much, much later probably. Well, yeah, speaking of the collection in, you know, 2011, how much of the collection was there? And again, I mean, how it seems like outside of the photos, but it's lower, but what happened to it? And, you know, did it just come over? And is, and I and you mentioned about things being added from alumni and that kind of stuff. But, you know, did they just like all of a sudden send everything over or how did you go about getting that? No, the archives had had the material for a while, a, um, decades, I would say, um, except for maybe the 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 born digital stuff had probably come maybe a, 10 years ago um, or 12 years ago. I think it predated me being here, so about 12 years ago. Um, so it had been here, and the programs and the media guides were organized chronologically fine. Um, they weren't in archive space. They weren't in any finding aid. The photos were partially organized. Um, it was a long-term project the previous university archivist had been working on to organize the photo collection, and it didn't get done before they retired. Um, so we kind of have to be working on that now. 
Yeah. But for the new donations that are coming in, we just sort of started a list of those. I mean, I accession them into archive space, so I can always go back and look at my accession records. But we just have a list of like, oh, yeah, we got, you know, a program from the October 12th, 1967 game that we didn't have before. Um, and someday, you know, we'll go back and digitize that. But um, we, we did know, do some gonna... of that. Yeah, yeah, we did do some little. inner filing and like, oh, yeah. hey, we got to get another batch of this. And my student was pretty great about working that into their workflow. So thankful for that. Yeah, but now we don't have a student right now. We have just a staff member who is doing the uploading. So we're not having that staff member digitized right now. And, and I think... Amy, or no, Wendy mentioned you. You mentioned a lot of the collection that there's photos, but there's also AV materials, mm -hmm. other things. How are you addressing the multiple mm -hmm. formats? Because I know they have to yeah. be a little bit older. Yeah, I, I skipped over the AV. Um, so this was uh, uh, we have a creative production lab in the library, so it's like you know they've got the A um, Media Center and the three D printers. They had a summer where they had students, but no work for them. And they were like, anybody have any work for our students could do? And I was like, do you have a VCR? <laughs> so we took out most of our uh, game film from the late 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. And they digitized those. Um, so there's no audio, mostly wide angle shots. Uh, we digitize it all. Very few people look at them. We have metadata. We have stats on that. Very few people look at those. Um, but they digitize most of it. Um, and then we had also digitized, we've gotten, we had some private money. It was, it tended to be like an end of the fiscal year. I've got $500 left. I can send out this film, you know, from the 1948 trip to Colorado um, and get that digitized or this 1967 game and get that digitized. So there's still um, not a lot of film because um, we don't have a lot of film. There's probably oh, less than 50 films to do. And there's about 30 VHS that I've found that had not been organized to do. We'll do that um, again as funds allow. Excellent. And I and you did talk, but I was going to say, what about campus partnerships? And Because you were talking about the alumni Facebook page, but you didn't, and then you mentioned the alumni association, but are there partners, I'll say on campus, whatever that, and again, what kind of support? Because Wendy talked to, yeah. Okay. It's, it's being recorded. I can't talk about that. <laughs> Okay. No, um, there there were some like attempts, I think, and some good faith, like, oh, maybe we can help you out with that. I won't mention the name of the department here for being recorded. Well, let me, um, let me but, switch yeah. it. How have they utilized it to, for their benefit? How how has oh. what you've done supported them in the bit? Well, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So this has been a big help to, I think, our athletics development unit as they've been, there's a new athletic director, there's a new chancellor. They've been making inroads with reconnecting with these alumni. So the libraries basically lost them as most of them as donors, potential donors. Um, so they're, they will use some of that content there. And we, they invite us to their events for the football alumni. So we have pop-up displays and things like that in our digital collection. So, yeah. But okay. it's still a touchy subject. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I want to ask about users and all that stuff, but we're coming to the end. So we want to thank Amy Wendy again. I put the session feedback form in the chat for people to fill out. So uh, everyone I really appreciate you attending the, the first part of the, the SOA conference. We look forward to seeing you either virtually tomorrow or in Columbus. And uh, again, be safe. And like I said, we'll hopefully see most of you tomorrow. But thanks again to Amy Wendy for, I, I thought, oh, um, yes. And, and thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, you Thanks everybody for coming. Yeah, see you right tomorrow.